The dawn crept in sluggishly, casting long, pale fingers of light over the skeletal trees surrounding the body farm. Dr. Michael Reeves stood at the edge of the clearing, watching as the morning mist curled and coiled like a living thing, reluctant to part from the cold earth. His breath hung in the air for a moment before vanishing, much like the lives he studied. This place, where death was laid bare for science, had always fascinated him. And yet, today, a chill that had nothing to do with the air gnawed at his bones. He glanced over at the rows of bodies scattered across the field, each at a different stage of decomposition, exposed to the elements in grotesque but necessary ways. What had once seemed like an ordered, clinical process now felt like an invitation to something far older, far darker than science could explain. Michael shook his head, willing the unease away. The body farm was a controlled environment, an essential part of forensic anthropology, not a place for wild imagination. Still, there was something about today, a feeling he couldn't name but couldn't quite dismiss. Dr. Sarah Klein was already at work, hunched over a clipboard, her expression as unreadable as always. She looked up briefly as Michael approached, her eyes flickering over him like a quick inspection. Subject 12 needs your attention today, she said, her voice cool and detached, as if discussing the weather. Check the decomposition rate. Report any anomalies. Her words hit him strangely. Anomalies? In this place, the very air seemed thick with unspoken ones, as if the farm itself was holding its breath, waiting for something inevitable and unseen. Michael nodded, trying to focus on the task at hand, even as a deepening disquiet gnawed at the edges of his mind. Subject 12. He made his way to the far side of the farm where the body lay, shrouded in the soft dampness of the morning air. The corpse, an older male, had been exposed for several weeks, long enough for the skin to pull tight against the bones, for decay to take its inexorable hold. Except it hadn't. Michael froze as he stood over the body, a sudden, primal unease rippling through him. The skin looked too intact. The eyes, half-lidded and lifeless, still seemed to glisten faintly with moisture, as if the spark of life had been snuffed out only days ago, not weeks. He knelt beside the body, his gloved hand trembling slightly as he examined the flesh. It was wrong. The texture, the scent, it was all wrong. He fumbled for his clipboard, trying to document what his mind refused to fully accept. Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe someone had moved this body, replaced it with another for reasons beyond his understanding. But no, the tag was clear subject 12, placed here exactly 22 days ago. The records were never wrong. Is there a problem? Dr. Klein's voice cut through the silence like a scalpel, sharp and cold. She stood behind him, her gaze unreadable, yet somehow far too penetrating for comfort. Michael swallowed hard, forcing himself to stand. It's just. The body looks fresher than it should. Are we sure the data is correct? Her lips twitched into something that might have been a smile, but it never reached her eyes. Of course. Our data is precise, Dr. Reeves. You know that. She held his gaze for a moment too long before turning away, leaving him standing there, the weight of her words pressing down on him like a suffocating blanket. Precise. The word echoed in his mind, a stark contrast to the writhing unease coiling in his gut. He turned back to the body, but the moment was gone. The sense of something terribly out of place remained, clinging to him like the cold mist. The rest of the morning passed in a blur of routine, yet the sense of wrongness shadowed him, deepening with each passing hour. He caught fleeting glimpses of the other assistants, Rachel and Victor, moving through their tasks like ghosts, their faces tight with some unspoken tension. It was as if the farm itself was closing in, its secrets pressing against the edges of his reality, waiting to spill over. It wasn't until later, as the sun began its slow descent into the horizon, that Michael heard it, the low murmur of voices, carried on the wind from the edge of the clearing. Dr. Klein was speaking to someone. Michael moved quietly, curiosity overcoming caution as he crept toward the thickening shadows of the treeling. Timing needs to be perfect, came Dr. Klein's voice, cold and clipped. A second voice responded, one Michael didn't recognize, a man's deep and deliberate. If they notice, there will be complications. Michael's heart pounded in his chest as he strained to hear more, but the conversation ended abruptly. He cursed under his breath and stepped back, intending to leave unnoticed, but his foot cracked a twig. The sound was deafening in the stillness. Silence. He didn't dare move. A few agonizing moments later, Dr. Klein's voice rang out, loud and direct. Dr. Reeves, is there something you need? Michael's blood ran cold as he stepped into view, forcing a nervous smile. Just checking on the equipment, he stammered, hoping his lie sounded plausible. Dr. Klein's expression remained unreadable, 
her eyes dark and cold. The man beside her gave Michael a slow, appraising look before turning away, disappearing into the growing shadows. Best not to linger too long in the dark, Dr. Reeves, she said softly, almost kindly. Some things are better left unseen. He nodded, throat dry, and made his way back to the main compound, the weight of her words pressing down on him like a vice. Some things are better left unseen. But Michael knew whatever was happening at the farm, whatever lurked beneath the surface, was far from unseen. Something was watching, waiting, biding its time in the dark recesses of this place. And he was beginning to think it had noticed him. The night settled heavily over the body farm, draping the landscape in an oppressive darkness that seemed to swallow sound, sight and thought aloud. Michael Reeves lay in his narrow cot, staring at the ceiling, replaying the events of the day over and over in his mind. Something about that conversation with Dr. Klein, the way she spoke of timing, and the man with the cold, unreadable face gnawed at him like a predator circling its prey. His body was still, but his thoughts raced, an uncontrollable torrent of fear and doubt. Subject 12 the name flickered in his mind like a dying candle. He couldn't shake the image of the body's unnaturally preserved flesh, the way the skin had clung to bone as if caught in some unnatural stasis, defying the inevitable march of decay. He told himself he must have made a mistake. Perhaps the cold snap that had swept through the region had slowed the decomposition process. But no, that was a thin excuse, a crumbling barrier against the gnawing truth that clawed at his subconscious. There was something wrong at the farm, and he was beginning to suspect it wasn't just the bodies. Sleep eluded him. The night dragged on, thick with silence, until he could no longer bear the weight of his thoughts. Rising from his cot, Michael slipped into the hallway, his footsteps muted against the cold stone floors. The air was heavy with the smell of antiseptic and something else, something faintly metallic, a scent that lingered at the edge of his senses, unplaceable yet familiar. He followed it like a sleepwalker drawn to the edge of some unseen abyss. The storage shed loomed ahead, a squat, windowless structure that housed the farm's meticulous records. In the day, it was a place of sterile order, but at night, it felt more like a tomb. The shadows clung to the corners, and the door seemed to resist his touch as he pried it open. Inside, the rows of filing cabinets stood like silent sentinels, guarding the secrets of the dead. Michael moved quickly, his fingers trembling slightly as he searched through the records. Subject 12 The file should have been routine, just a few notes on the time of death the condition of the body, and the expected timeline for decomposition. But what he found chilled him to the core. Subject 12 was listed as disposed three weeks ago. The body wasn't supposed to be on the farm at all. According to the records, it had been marked for incineration and removed from the facility. Michael stared at the report, his pulse pounding in his ears. His breath came shallow and quick as the implications sank in. If Subject 12 wasn't supposed to be there, then where had the body come from? He felt a prickling sensation on the back of his neck, as though unseen eyes were watching him from the dark corners of the shed. He turned, half expecting to see someone standing behind him, but the space was empty. Still, the feeling of being observed lingered, pressing in from all sides. The walls of the shed seemed to close in around him, the air thick and suffocating. Michael hurriedly shoved the file back into place and left the shed, his mind a whirl of questions with no answers. The wind howled through the trees, a mournful wail that seemed to echo his own growing sense of dread. The next morning he approached Rachel, hoping to find some semblance of sanity in the face of the mounting madness. She was one of the few people on the farm who had always seemed grounded, approachable. Maybe she could help him make sense of things. I think something's wrong, Michael said quietly as they stood near the break room, away from the others, with the bodies, with Dr. Klein. Subject 12 was supposed to be gone weeks ago, but it's still there. Rachel's expression tightened, her eyes darting to the side before meeting his. Michael, you're overthinking this, she whispered, glancing around nervously. Sometimes mistakes happen with the paperwork. You know that. Just let it go. The way she said it, the urgency in her voice, the fear in her eyes, it didn't feel like reassurance. It felt like a warning. Let it go, Michael repeated, incredulous. This isn't just a clerical error, Rachel. There's something else going on. Don't you feel it? Something's off. She hesitated, biting her lip, and for a brief moment, Michael thought she might confess to feeling the same unease that had been gnawing at him. But then her face hardened, and she shook her head, her voice dropping to a harsh whisper. We drop it before you get in over your head, Michael. Some things, some things are better left alone. She walked away quickly, leaving him standing there with a sinking feeling in his gut. 
Rachel had always been straightforward, even blunt at times. This sudden shift in her demeanor only deepened his suspicions. What was she so afraid of? Later that night, as Michael lay in bed, his phone buzzed with a notification. He reached for it, expecting some trivial message from a colleague. But when he unlocked the screen, his blood ran cold. You're being watched. The message had no sender, no name, only those three words. He stared at the screen, heart pounding, feeling the weight of invisible eyes pressing in on him again. He jumped out of bed, peering out the small window, half expecting to see a shadowy figure lurking just beyond the reach of the pale moonlight. But the clearing was empty, the trees still and silent. Fear gnawed at his insides, twisting his stomach into knots. Could Victor have sent the message? Or was it Dr. Klein herself, warning him to stop asking questions? The next day, he made a decision. He couldn't trust anyone, not Rachel, not Victor, and certainly not Dr. Klein. But he had to know the truth. Whatever was happening at the farm, whatever they were hiding, it was bigger than him, bigger than science. And it was wrong. That evening, under the cover of darkness, Michael followed Dr. Klein. He trailed her from a distance as she made her way to the far end of the farm, to the restricted area where only new arrivals were kept. His heart pounded in his chest as he watched her unlock the gate and disappear inside. For several agonizing minutes, there was only silence. Then, faintly, the sound of something heavy being dragged across the ground. Michael crept closer, his breath shallow as he peered through the trees. Dr. Klein emerged, pulling a large, shrouded form behind her. It was too large, too still to be anything other than a body. But who or what was it? The cold realization dawned on him then, like a creeping shadow at the edge of his mind, whatever they were doing at the farm. It wasn't just about studying the dead. It was something far, far worse. The night air clung to Michael like the cold hand of a corpse, damp and suffocating. He stood frozen behind the tree line, watching Dr. Klein drag the shrouded form into the restricted area. His heart raced, each thud reverberating in his ears like the distant toll of a funeral bell. Something monstrous lurked beneath the surface of this place, something beyond death itself. Forcing himself to move, Michael crept closer, careful to keep to the shadows. The gates had clanged shut behind Dr. Klein, but through a narrow gap in the fencing, he could just make out the faint outline of what lay beyond. The restricted area was little more than a rough, makeshift building, a low structure surrounded by cold, unfeeling steel. But inside, beyond those walls, was something more, something alive. He could hear it, a soft, rhythmic pulse, like the slow, labored breathing of some ancient thing awakening from its long slumber. The ground beneath his feet seemed to tremble faintly, as though the earth itself was shuddering in recognition of what had been buried there. His skin prickled as a wave of nausea rolled through him, the sheer wrongness of it pressing down on him like a physical weight. He had to know what was inside. Michael slipped through the fence, careful to avoid the security cameras mounted at awkward angles above the gate. He crouched low, the shadows of the compound swallowing him whole. The sense of dread that had followed him since his first day on the farm now felt like an inescapable presence, a living, breathing thing that clung to his skin, whispered in his ear, and twisted his thoughts into shapes they should never take. The door to the building creaked open, and for a moment, Michael froze. Dr. Klein stepped out, her movements deliberate, her face a mask of cold concentration. She stared into the darkness for a long moment, as though sensing that she was being watched. Michael held his breath, pressing himself deeper into the shadows, his heart pounding in his chest. Finally, she turned and walked away, disappearing into the night. Michael exhaled shakily and approached the door she had left ajar. He stepped inside, his footfall silent against the damp earth. The air in the room was thick, oppressive. It smelled of rot, but also of something else, something metallic, acrid, and old. The walls seemed to pulse with a faint energy, like the beating of a heart buried deep underground, far from human sight. At the far end of the room, he saw them the bodies. They lay on cold, metal slabs, their skin stretched tight over brittle bones, but they were not dead. Not entirely. Their chests rose and fell with shallow, almost imperceptible breaths. Their eyes, glassy, vacant, stared into nothingness. It was as though they had been trapped in the moment between life and death, held there by some force that Michael could not comprehend. A sharp, metallic clatter echoed from behind him, and Michael spun around, his breath catching in his throat. Victor stood at the entrance, his expression unreadable, his silhouette barely visible in the dim light. His eyes gleamed with a strange, unnatural light. You shouldn't be here, Michael, Victor said, his voice low, a warning. You weren't supposed to see this. Michael's mouth was dry, his thoughts racing. What? 
What is this? What are you doing to them? Victor stepped forward, his face coming into the light. There was something wrong with him. His features were too still, too smooth. His skin looked almost plastic, like a mask stretched over a hollow frame. It's not what we're doing to them, Victor said, his voice unnervingly calm. It's what they've already done to us. Michael took a step back, his head spinning. What are you talking about? Oh. Um. Victor sighed, almost regretfully. We're caretakers, Michael. You, me, Rachel, Dr. Klein, we've been chosen. The bodies aren't just research subjects. They're conduits, vessels for something far older than anything our science can explain. They come here through us, through our work. They awaken in stages, preparing for the moment when they will no longer need us. Michael felt his stomach lurch, bile rising in his throat. He stared at the bodies, those hollow, breathing shells, and the truth began to unravel in his mind like a nightmare that had no end. You're insane, Michael whispered, backing further away. This isn't possible. It's not. It's already happened, Victor interrupted. You felt it, haven't you? The weight. The sense that this place is more than it seems. They've been watching you too, Michael. Watching and waiting. And now that you've seen them, there's no turning back. As if summoned by Victor's words, a low hum began to fill the air. It grew louder, more insistent until it became a throbbing vibration that rattled the walls and reverberated through Michael's skull. The bodies on the slabs twitched, their eyes flickering open, blank and empty, as though some ancient consciousness had stirred within them. Michael turned to flee, but Victor's hand clamped down on his arm, his grip impossibly strong. You can't run, Michael, he said softly, his voice laced with a strange sadness. You belong to them now, just like the rest of us. In a desperate burst of strength, Michael wrenched himself free, stumbling toward the door. He threw it open and ran into the night, the cold air biting at his skin, his breath coming in ragged gasps. Behind him, he could still hear the hum, rising in pitch, filling the air with an unbearable sense of dread. He ran through the trees, his legs burning, his mind screaming for him to stop, to turn back, to understand what had just happened. But all he could think about was the sound, the sound of something far older than humanity, far older than the earth itself awakening beneath the farm. The stars above him seemed impossibly distant, cold and uncaring. He was alone in a world that no longer felt like his own. The farm, the bodies, the people he had once trusted, they were all part of something vast and unknowable, something that had reached across eons to claim him. And no matter how far he ran, Michael knew one thing with terrifying certainty whatever had stirred beneath the farm was not finished with him. It never would be.